Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, possibly good evening, good whatever, and welcome back to the Roger Report podcast, where we are recording the first Sunday night pod since the sacking of manager Jack Ross. At the time of recording this, Ross has been let go by Sunderland and the owners are currently looking for his managerial replacement. My name is Alex and I am joined today by three other fellow Roker reporters in the studio. On my right we have Neil. How are you doing Neil? I am good thanks. Yeah, good to be here. Yeah. How are you doing on uh, football wise? How are you getting on? How did you um, uh, spend your, your Saturday without Sunderland? I've been watching more rugby than football to be honest. Right. Uh, yeah, it's a, a struggle on international weekend so um, I can't wait for the league, league action to take, uh, come back here. Yeah. Do you need some kind of sport just to, just to tide you over? Any sport, really, yeah. Uh, I'll watch anything. Um, so, yeah, but uh, looking forward to getting back into league action and hopefully with a new man in place. Yep. And I'm also joined by Sam. How are you doing, Sam? I'm all right, mate. How are you? Um, I'm decent, you know. Not not too bad. Uh, plodding on. Mm. Just getting by. How did you spend your Saturday without Sunderland? Um, I, so I started off enjoying it in the morning when I didn't have to think about going to the match or watching the match, but... As the day goes on, you need your intake of football, don't you? So I, I went on to FIFA, which was it was all right, but wasn't yeah. the same. Wasn't the same. Yeah, I feel like everything that we do on a Saturday at around three o'clock time is just a pale imitation of watching glorious League One football. Yeah. Whether it's watching a different sport or playing an e-sport, you know, it's always You've got something. Got to be doing something, haven't you? Got to be doing something. And I'm also joined finally by Ant. How are you doing, Ant? I'm all right, man. How are you? Yeah, you know. Still as good as I was. Still as good as I was ten seconds ago. I was a stupid question. <laughs> Mate, you, you, you're not the first person to say that, and you won't be the last. Don't worry about it's it. Just being polite, isn't it? Uh, yeah, and, and you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. So anyway, what? How did? Uh, since I've asked you the two lads the same question, yeah. I will pose it to you as well. How did you spend your Saturday? I wasn't too badly hung up on it, to be honest. I actually watched the League One match today uh, on Sky, Coventry versus Tranmere. Um, it was dreadful. So, yeah, yeah. I think uh, Tranmere won one 0 Yeah, not entirely dissimilar to every other game of League One football Pretty we've much, watched. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it. it yeah. I mean, I, I want to say it is what it is, but I keep using that to justify too many things that happen in League One with Sunderland. So I'm not going to. For what it's worth, I spent yesterday watching Sunderland last year, and that was pretty good. They got beat 6-2 by... Um, they hammered, didn't they? Oh, yeah, they got beat 6-2 <laughs> off Whitley Bay. But, you know, like the, 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 to be fair, like the actual game itself, I mean, I know Sunderland, RCA would be by birthright my team, but, you know, you're effectively a neutral, so it, it's 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 kind of good just, like, watching mm. quite a open-ended game of football because it was, like, it was end-to-end. -end. It's just that the team that wasn't called Sunderland was scoring when it was their end. But anyway, yeah, so before we get into... Obviously, the elephant in the room, which is the loss of Ross, the second of Jack Ross. We will have a brief chat on Sunderland's most recent game, which has hitherto not been covered on a on a Roker Report podcast, on a Roker Report podcast rather. So that's the, that would be the Grimsby game in which Sunderland won three two. So, what do we make of that game, Sam? We'll go to you first. Um, I thought it was good. Not great to be conceding two goals, like, but with the second of Ross happening five hours before or something, which was an odd time and you just needed to win the game really and it was a strong team that got played and the last podcast I was on we were discussing what more mm -hmm. and whether we should cut ties albeit how sad it is and I thought he did well actually for his first game however long he, he looked a threat which he always does and he, he does offer that something different so it was nice to see him get a run about and he was probably man of the match for me and it was also nice to see uh, Greg getting the winner which I think Hume needs great credit for the cross mm -hmm. so it was a great assist and he's he's in in recent weeks, in recent games he's played, I think Hume silenced some of the critics at the start of the season, which is always nice to see from a young lad coming through. So, no, overall, you just needed the win after what happened with Ross, so successful uh, night, really. Absolutely, and I think, as you say there, it's very good to have Will Grigg and Duncan Watmore be on the score sheet. Just having Watmore get minutes, just having Watmore get minutes rather, is, is yeah, good exactly. enough, really, I think. I think a lot of us probably weren't expecting him to be featuring uh, this soon back in the starting eleven in, in any team, really. But I thought this one, this question to you, Ant. I mean, obviously, you know, if there's two players who really needed goals for different reasons, it's Grigg and Watmore. Yeah. Uh, is is it significant enough that they've scored in the Grimsby game in the Leasing dot com trophy, or do they really need those games in a more serious fixture for it to matter? 
I think for Greg, it was a massive, uh, hopefully a massive one for him because, uh, you know, he's been like a rabbit in headlights, hasn't he? When the ball's been cut, he's been missing a few chances and stuff. And um, I thought he took it well. A lot of people said, oh, he never meant it, never meant it, headed it, headed it the wrong way and all. But I, like um, Alex just said, it was a lovely cross. And yeah, hopefully that's that's him up and running. Um, what more? It's just great to see him back for me. Um, I'm not with all this, oh, he just runs about, you know, he's like a bull chasing a matador and all that stuff. You know what? He's got pace. He's got what none of our players have got, a mm-hmm. bit of pace. So, and he'll cause trouble for uh, League One defences. I'm over the moon for him, to be honest. Is it quite a relief seeing what more still have pace, given the nature of his quite serious leg injuries? Oh, yeah. I mean, in fair play to him, he's had, what, two really bad knee injuries. And I think it was his ankle, wasn't it? A terrible tackle on him. And for someone his age... To, you, you would get down, wouldn't you? You're a young lad and stuff. And from the like, you know, he, he always keeps his head down. You never hear him out of the out of like football. You never hear him on the back page or anything like that. So fair play to him. Mm-hmm. What did you make of it, Neil? Just yeah, the, 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 obviously the, the the timing of the second was going to have an influence on the game. And I think the, the first half was was pretty much pre season friendly kind of stuff. Um, and we're kind of whatever Fowler said at half time seemed to work because it, it kind of changed and obviously Grimsey going ahead perhaps changed the mindset I think the echo the points in terms of what more it was great to see him and, and you can just see for even for me I know he has a second touch before his first sometimes but generally his touch was a cut above anyone else on the on the field really you could see his extra quality in there so it'd be good to see if you can get up through five six games and and try and have an impact um I think the most frustrating thing for me is that we were playing a, a, a League Two side with, as Ant says, a, a, a really strong side. And we still saw Ledbitter and Dobson kind of both sitting as kind of defensive midfielders. They, they were like two kids when you go on holiday and you meet someone and you never leave that that that, that kid alone. And uh, <laughs> um, I must say when you're a kid, obviously. But um, but yeah, they, it's kind of, they, they just never, they were never more than 10 yards apart. There was no kind of urgency in either of them getting forwards. Um and that was kind of frustrating. And it, as I guess Grimms retired, we came into the game and kind of our, our extra kind of quality showed. But um, but yeah, the, the difficult circumstances overall. Um, yeah. I know the game's not obviously the most significant game in the world. I don't think any Sunderland fans are going to rush back to Wembley for the Leasing.com trophy in a hurry. But that being said, obviously, every game that you play should be a game in which you consolidate your identity. And obviously, hitherto, we've not really seen one at all under Ross and indeed we won't under Fowler because he's, he's, he's merely there as the interim mm. but is, is it annoying to, to really see that we're still kind of playing a holding midfielder at all given given our ambitions at this standard of football you know holding midfielders imply a more defensive style of play generally should we even have one on the pitch when we're playing Grimsby at home uh, I think given the quality and perhaps the, the how often our defensive play together I think at least, yes, one hold midfielder or at least a defensive midfielder. Uh, but what I saw on Tuesday was more kind of that both Dobson and Ledbetter, particularly when we didn't have the ball, obviously, um, but also when we did have the ball, literally just sitting back and going through the motions where mm. um, certainly Dobson's capable of, of getting forward and making those kind of kind of runs. And Ledbetter is obviously quality from outside the box. He was never outside the box once to kind of to test their keeper. Um Instead, he had some kind of really random kind of shots from 40, 45 yards where he was trying to lob the keeper and so on. So, so yeah, I, I mean, that's obviously coming. I think Ross's kind of tactics and kind of formation was still evident um, and expectantly so, I guess. But um, I would like to see a change in that, certainly, going forward. Absolutely. I suppose that's a very good time as well to get on to what is the elephant in the room, which has just been sacked and had its ivory taken from it. So, Jack Ross has obviously gotten the sack. You know, he's here no longer. We'll go for the very basic, most fundamental question. We'll start with you, Ant. Mm-hmm. What was that the right decision? Yes or no? I think in hind, uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, um, I know that's a lot of people on Twitter and everything around about not ninety eight percent are saying it's the right decision. I'm in agreement with us. I believe he's had eighteen months to try and get us out of this division. Um, just wasn't going to be happening this season with them. We have not played well at all, I don't think, this season. Um, and I came on this pod against Portsmouth and I did defend him. I thought he needed his um, opportunity, but we're just not looking as if we're going to do anything at all, are we? We're, we're scraping 1-0 wins, 2-1 wins or whatever. We're not 1-0 because we don't keep a clean sheet, but we're scraping past teams that we should be beating, I would say, relatively comfortably. Um, and the two games which I think sealed him is Bolton and Lincoln. And 
I'm sorry, like um, this might come foul of a guest who was on here last week, one of the um, journalists, I think it was Hunter. Um, the fans, I think, are entitled to be a little bit disappointed to draw against Bolton, who'd been getting hammered all season, and to get beat off Lincoln, who were on a five-game run, run without scoring a goal, I believe. So, yeah, right decision. But it'll be our fault, won't it? It'll be the fans' fault again. So. <laughs> well, I mean, when we look at the games themselves, you look at games like Rochdale, you look at games like MK Dons, mm. and, I mean, let, let's say, I mean, obviously you aren't going to batter every single team in the league, and we've no. said that before, but you would expect, wouldn't you, at least yeah. one of those games to be a 3-0 win rather than like the, the, the edgy two ones yeah. where you know we're probably marginally the better team overall. Can you point a game out where you've actually come here and think we've played well today mm-hmm. this season? I can't. I really can't. Well, for the not, not this season, no. Uh, I, I probably have to go back as far as maybe Scunthorpe last season, this time last year. Mm. When we won 3-0, I think, yeah, we totally dominated that game. Or Rochdale 4-1. But those just seem like a million years ago now. Yeah. Like... I think the main issue, well, I think b- b- before we get into that, obviously we'll we'll pose the exact same question to to Sam and then to Neil respectively. So, Sam, the sacking of Ross, yes or no? Was it the right decision? Yeah, it was. It was the right decision. I think. I think in the end it was justified. Really, I mean, like you said, I've I've been to three away games this season: Rochdale, Bolton, and Lincoln. And even in the Rochdale game, you just you're watching it. And you'd, you'd you're just thinking, what's the plan? And it's like at the start of the season, he, he tried to bring his own plan to the team with the uh, three or five at the back, mm-hmm. which you were thinking that's his identity, it's what worked for him in the past, and you're thinking this is his stamp on the team. And then he abandoned him after the two games, I think it was, which at, at the time was probably the right thing to do, but I don't, I don't know, he just... You look at uh, the Lincoln game, it was it was one of the worst games I've seen for a long time. It, we could still be playing now, and I don't think we'd score in that game, and we had three strikers on the pitch, but just... It looked like he'd lost it in the end. I mean, I think all nine played three different positions that game. And it, once you lose the fans at this club, it's, it's very hard, as we've seen in the past, to get them back. You never want anyone to lose the job, but I think it was the right decision in the end. And we need a, a new style to come in and get people excited or at the end just ultimately get the results against teams that we should be comfortably beaten. Absolutely. I think... Now, I don't know about you, but obviously what you said there about his sort of 3-5-2 formation that was, I think, his attempt, as you said there, at a stamp on the team, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a, an attempt of establishing an identity. Yeah. But as it transpired, that, that didn't work. And since then, did we see anything resembling a, a new style of play or was it just a sort of attempt at winging it to I, win games? Yeah, I, think, I, think, I, think, I don't think he had the right players for what he wanted to do, which you can look at this. Did he tell the recruitment team? Do you want was that down to the recruitment? Who's it down to? You you're never really got another full story. But like you say, it does just look like winging it. I mean, against Lincoln, McGeady came on, and I doubt he's even a hundred percent fit. And you just I watched players just give him the ball, and then just sort of stand there thinking, right, do something. Which to have a player like McGeady at this level is a privilege, really. But he's never gonna. He, he's not magic, is he? And mm-hmm. Yeah, like McGeady's like an unfit McGeady's not like a remedy to when you're playing badly, is it? Because he doesn't track back, he doesn't, no. you know, he just gets a ball, does a bit of magic, and then hopefully we score from it. And it's like it's a bit basic, isn't it? It's like, oh, we'll, we'll do. Oh, Aiden will come on, he'll score. It's like mm, that's what it felt like against like, Lincoln. Yeah, and he's and he's a fantastic player. Don't get us wrong, yeah. but he's not Lionel Messi. He's not Ronaldo, is it? He's just. In McGee. He gave the ball away for the second goal as well, and he yeah. never looked the same since. I know he had a bit of bother with one of their fans, which mm. well, I honestly think one with, standard. Um, why Hume was struggling early on in the season was because of McGee not getting back and helping them out. Yeah. He's a young lad, you know what I mean? He's like just learning the game and stuff like that. And for not getting any help off an experienced player is for mm-hmm. me a little bit like kind of lazy from, from McGee, but. I agree completely. I think in a season that you're expecting to be Denver Hume's first full season as like a senior professional mm-hmm. footballer, you can't expect in his first game for him to be the full back and the winger rolled no, into no, one. No, no. I know that's no, what no. The, I know that's what they call the wing back, but as we saw in Jack Ross's five three two um, amalgamation of a football style, there wasn't really such thing as an effective wing back there. There wasn't much of anything that really worked. So I think you know I think Hume was dealt a pretty bad hand from the get go, given players on the pitch and and where it what 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 his tactical role was meant to be. But yeah, I don't know. It was just it, it was just a mess in the end when you when you look at it in hindsight. But anyway, uh, we'll go to you for the last one, Neil. So Jack Ross sacking 
was it? Was it yeah, I, th- I, th- I think it was always going to come. I think the, the the timing more than anything was kind of what, what was up for debate. And I think obviously at National Weekend, you you, you see these kind of things happen. Um, I, I wrote an article for the uh, for the website during the week and looked at kind of six or seven kind of key moments. And I think that the first one was the sale of Josh Madger last season. And we kind of ummed and ahed to say kind of, should we try and keep him? Should we try and sell him and keep him on loan? Or, and essentially we cashed in on him. And I think that was the, we've never replaced him. I think I did, I'm not really great for stats, but I think Wyke, McGeady, McNulty, what more, they combined, they haven't scored as many goals as what Madger scored in, at the beginning of that season. So, And I think if you take on McGeady, but I think if you include all the other ones, then combined, you haven't scored as many. Yeah, and, and, and as, as we alluded to there, in terms of um, kind of McGeady and t- t- did I say McGeady? I meant McNulty. That's in the term, one. Yeah, um, yeah but um, you, you put that emphasis on McGeady, which kind of, it's too much of an emphasis, and, and that's kind of proved in terms of how the upside of the team's become. And I think I think with Ross, the, the main issue with me, there's these individual kind of performances, Peterborough away particularly, although, albeit against a good side, um, but Bolton away, I was there as well. Um and finally, Lincoln as well. I think the real issue is kind of there's nothing changed from last season. And in a, in a world where we can quantify everything, the, the clear point here is that kind of the team hasn't changed in terms of the playing style. The results aren't changing. And if you kind of look at those results one by one, then essentially this season we've done well against the kind of bottom bottom half sides. But whenever we come up with against a kind of top half side, that's where we kind of drop in points and. I think the next three or four games, we we against kind of th- three or four sides in the in the top half, and had Ross been still in place and that didn't go well, then I think we could have been a lot lower than than what we are now. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, they, they, I wrote about there was six or seven kind of watershed moments, but I think the the the, the lack of replacement for Josh Madger so far, um, which is frustrating because we've got the resources and went out and spent money on on Greg, and but there's other kind of forwards who are doing really well who we were linked with. Uh, Moisa and uh, Ivan Tony at Peterborough and knocking them in all over exactly the kind of player that we need at the minute and we just haven't replaced them so I think once Madger went that was kind of a, a big issue in terms of Ross's future and that how everything That two transfer planned. windows is about to replace him as an interest yeah. it has yeah. yeah. mm-hmm. I mean I think the closest we've had so far is Mark McNulty looking like a replacement but mm. the issue with McNulty is that he's been quite injury prone mm. and he's also yeah. only on loan so I think if you're looking both long term and short term, it doesn't really feel like it's the answer. Is there an element as well, Neil, going back to you, that Ross was just throughout his entirety of his 18 months at Sunderland just too stubborn? Um, I think at the beginning he was. I think I think the fact that he ditched his three five two or five three two, whatever you want to call it, at the beginning of the season, he ditched that fairly quickly. I think if he started last season or that, he would have stuck with that for perhaps another four, five, six games. Um whether it's stubbornness, uh, that, that I, th- I think the main problem with me and the reason why people are shouting for Keane now, we'll talk on about replacement shortly, but the kind, the type of character of Keane and uh, McCarthy, even Mick McCarthy, for instance, the the, the proper characters and they bring that and they bring that to the North East and that's what the North East is about. When, when I've worked elsewhere in the country and abroad and so on, everyone talks about kind of character of the North East. And I think kind of Ross's big kind of downfall is that He's very professional and kind of his leaving statement through the LMA was superb. And But I just don't think the fans bought into him as a person. Um, and, it's, and and that kind of put him on the back foot straight away. Um, he did a lot of good things and he, he's kind of overall, I think he did he did a good job. But I think he just kind of was lacking in the last kind of maybe four or five months for me. Mm-hmm. Was he maybe just, I know it's, I know it's quite a... It, it seems like quite a straw man kind of term, but he was a very diplomatic person. He was very he was very safe, to put it in its simplest terms. But maybe in League One, that isn't what you need. I mean, if you look at you know one of the most successful managers currently, I know I've banged the drum for this man as manager. I'm not about to do that now, but it, it works as a as a good example. But Gareth Ainsworth is you know for for, for what for want of a of a nice term is quite a nasty bloke. That's probably the nicest I can put it for him as a manager, for him and his style of play. Now, he seems to be currently kicking his way to the top of League One. You know, his Wickham team are doing very, very well. Whereas I think everything that Jack Ross has done at Sunderland, he's done with his hands in his pockets, quite literally, with a cardigan on. <laughs> you know, and, and again, you know, that, they, they sound like straw man points. They sound like quite like ad, ad, ad hominem arguments. But ultimately, uh, how successful can you be if you're very polite and diplomatic? His style of play would always allow opposition teams to 
to get into more dangerous areas when we let off them. We were quite a polite team. Is that perhaps, let's go to, I'll go to you, Sam, is that perhaps another one of his failings that maybe sometimes his style of football wasn't as aggressive as it needed to be? I think so, yeah. It started, um, I started seeing this point towards the end of last season. You could see it on the pitch. I mean, I, I hear cheating and play acting or whatever, but every team we play, it seems, waste time, go down for fouls, mm-hmm. take throw-ins, 10 yards up the pitch, drives me dad insane. But we never seem to do that. We never seem to surround the ref. I'm not saying I want us to cheat or whatever, but if it's what gets you out of this division, mm-hmm. I'd happily do it. And See the game, I think it just, it's sort of like, it, you look at him on the, the touchline and I thought it was great start when we first got him. Oh, he's calm, he's collected and he's probably a lovely bloke, but he sort of never, he never adapted to like mm-hmm. the situation or whatever game we were playing. You look at Wembley and stuff and you want someone screaming and shouting and that that could be stubbornness or it could just be, that's, that's the type of man he is. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? He doesn't want to, doesn't want to change yeah. for anyone. You could never like picture him, could you, at half time when the players were playing bad, like properly laying into them Not to really like get the backs up. He just he, he always had the vibe of someone who talked in the exact same tone he spoke in press conferences all yeah. the time. Mm. Yeah, and again, uh, like uh, uh, the last thing I want to do is start to have like little digs here and there, like for anything more than just like a petty sort of like throwaway joke. But Ultimately, those little things, those little character traits do kind of add up and make a persona. And ultimately, that persona was not someone, as we all said there, that the Sutherland mm-hmm. fans generally identify with. But anyway, I feel like, like I said there, we've, we've ripped into women off, to put it bluntly. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's, sadly, it's been very much justified because the football's not been acceptable, quite frankly. But, you know, there were good times with Ross. And, and you know, I think if we're going to go from being miseries to happy clappers in one fell swoop, <laughs> can we recall the, the good times under Jack Ross? I'll start with you, and we'll start in reverse order. We'll start with you, Neil. Happiest memory watching Jack Ross's Sunderland? Um, hmm. I, th- I, th- I think going to Wembley uh, it was my little boy's first time at Wembley. I, th- I think he, let's not forget, if we'd won those two games at Wembley, he'd be, he'd be almost kind of hero status now. Yeah. Um, so that's the kind of fine lines of, 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 of football, really. Um, I, th- that, I think the, the kind of. It, Outstanding moments. Um, I enjoyed Rochdale last season. The honeyman winner for me it kind of stands out off, off the top of my head. I, th- I think the key thing with Ross, and we talk about other managers perhaps in a in f- more favourable manager, uh, manner, but I think that calmness and assurance was needed at the time. And kind of 18 months is a long time in football, and I think it's maybe just kind of t- now time to move past that. We've kind of stabilised the club on and off the field, and I think it's just time for someone else. Um, but yeah, probably was Rochdale away again. I had my little boy with us as well, which was nice. And um, yeah, I think maybe that's part of the problem. There's not that many kind of standout moments, perhaps, in terms of um, when you think of Ross. Whereas if you saw a manager running down the touchline after a last-minute winner and so on, then that maybe kind of sticks in your head a little bit more, and the, yeah. the kind of character come out. And kind of the, one last comment before we move on. But when Chris Coleman was here, for all his record was really poor. I listened to his press conferences. I wanted to kind of be there when they started and I was interested in what he had to say because he was an engaging character. And I think with Ross, he just wasn't that kind of engaging character that's kind of that that, that we need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sam, what about you? Completely agree, really. You, you've got to see the two Wembley trips to get there in the first place, albeit one of them by playoffs. It tends to be an achievement. Um, one game that stands out particularly might be a bit of a controversial one because it was a nil-nil, but... We were talking before about um, we don't well we didn't really show much fight on the pitch or anything. But I thought Portsmouth away in the uh, second leg, thought it was a great great performance from everyone. Just particularly Ledbetter after uh, just finding out that his mum had died, and I thought that was a great great performance from Ross. It looked like the players were really together and they really wanted it. And then that was to get a Wembley, which is another weekend out for the fans. Really sadly, they didn't end the way we wanted them to, but. Like Neil said, he was a penalty shootout and 45 minutes away from two trophies and a promotion. Yeah. So, and he'll always be thinking that. And it must be agonising. It must from, be hard. Like yeah. from his perspective, he must just think like if if the wind was just blowing the right way, or if, exactly. if, if maybe you look at the fine margins of both the games. Let's say that shot led bit of hard in like the 18th minute at Wembley. Let's say that goes in, right, and it's two 0 and then suddenly Charlton's heads are properly down and they're suddenly mortified of yeah. being battered at Wembley in, in 20 minutes, and we'll go on to win. And then let's say in, in the same season, 
you know, you, you had just a little bit more of an aggressive 45 minutes against Portsmouth in the second half. Mm. Maybe you made one more goal count and you killed them off as well. Exactly. All of a sudden, right? You, you're in. We're, we're talking about Jack Ross's championship team now, and it could just be in. With the, 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 who knows? Like it's like a butterfly effect. Who knows where we could be now? He could be doing absolutely unreal now in, in a more maybe. In a, in a division of perhaps maybe some more sophisticated football, you might say. I know that's yeah. quite a strange term to use, but yeah, it, it, it's like he must be looking back and just wondering what could have been. Must be quite a, a, a tough pill to swallow, but you know, I suppose it is what it is. Well, you look at where Charlton are; they're doing they're doing really well it's considering yeah. what yeah. after they beat us at Wembley, they didn't even know if Boyer was going to sign a contract. I don't think they've invested anything. They lost some of the best players. It just needs to go for you, really. That could easily be us right now with. Like you said, more sophisticated football. I think someone like McGeoch in the championship would be a great player. Just it's all about getting out of this division, which mm-hmm. unfortunately for Ross, he, he didn't do. But again, he was agonisingly close, really. Yeah. Anyway, and yeah, best memory under Ross. Yeah, I'll I'll point a different one out because I did enjoy Wembley and I did enjoy um, the Portsmouth away game. Um, but I'm going to say Gillingham away last season when we yep. won four one. That would have been um, mine. Just for going down there, considering an early goal, um, <laughs> and then just completely blowing the team apart in about 15 minutes. It was it was wonderful. And I can just remember I remember saying to one of my mates, Matty, I remember just saying, I'm sick of being good now. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was just it was just like it was such a like a nice kind of like as we opened up against Charlton Dinner and we scored like in the last minute and we saw Ross running down the time, the sidelines were like great. But um I think just yeah, just that when you're kind of like thinking, ah, oh, it's turned a little bit now. Mm-hmm. That was it, wasn't it? That yeah. was going to be mine as well. And to be fair, like that that little sort of like period, like the sort of like the 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 the, the earliest sort of did the honeymoon period of sort of new Sunderland without Ross, mm-hmm. without Martin Bain. When obviously, yeah, we're in League One and we don't want to be there, no. but we were having games where you know for twenty and thirty minutes we were just blowing teams to bits, and it was really fun to watch, mm-hmm. like. Rochdale four one, Jellycombe four one, Scunthorpe three 0 They were great games. You know, we might we might not have been outstanding for the entirety of the game, but for those periods where we were clinical, it was just wonderful to see that we weren't the team capitulating because for so long, I don't think we realised at the time just how much we were suffering from just mediocre football. Mm. To suddenly be the winning team was almost quite surreal, almost like it wasn't really meant to be happening. But no, I mean, I'm I'm thankful for Jack Ross for the like the this the some of the games he did give us, but ultimately. We have to look at his tenure as a failure, which yeah. is, it's never nice to say. I, I don't ever want a manager to, to fail at Sunderland for obvious reasons, but you know, I'm, I'm thankful for, for the games that were enjoyable, but sadly, you know, it, it wasn't enough to, to justify him having a job here. So I think that's probably a good place to, to move on to the next topic. So obviously, Ross is gone, but there are a multitude of different people that have been selected by the bookies to be the alleged candidates most likely to get the job but regardless of who the front runners are at Betway or wherever who do we think or who do we want rather who do we want to get the job and oh start with me um, I've changed my mind every day since he's been sacked so I've went Stendhal I've went Ainsworth I've went uh, Nigel Pearson um, and I know, with with Kevin Phillips he's number two that, that would be me little left wing one um, I'm going to say Stendhal just for I think watching Barnsley last season coming to the stadium of light and going down there even though it was windy and they're the best team I saw against us we we, we beat and beat them but like he had a team who played football, attacking football he got like Keith, Keith Mill up front who like defenders was bouncing off him and mm-hmm. stuff like that they scored some really nice goals from what I saw he had a very very good home record um, at Oakwell and I do think at Barnes he's been very unfairly treated. You know, and have sold all the players from under him and stuff. I think he's probably going to get my vote. I'm not sure if he'll get it, but there we are. No, I think it would seem to be like the logically the best choice, given the fact that he's out of a job. Yeah. That he played what was what was being assured by Barnsley fans was very very good football for League One, very great attack and football. And as you say there, when we played them, and yeah, we won four two, and on paper that looks like a good win for us, mm. having put four goals past them, but. On another day, that could have been five nil of them. Could have yeah. been three nil of them. Could have been two two. It could have been any number of scores. Because it was just yeah. such like a bizarre, like well, not bizarre, but it's just like a end to end kind of game. And that Kiefer Moe looked like an absolute world beater. But ultimately, he's just a League One striker. So if you can get your strikers playing like that, mm-hmm. then hopefully you can you can give Charlie White or Gregor a kick up the backside. 
as much as well that uh, don't condone down and shots of tequila but when you saw that on twitter yeah. with stendhal doing that you're like go yeah. god that. <laughs> you know yeah. what i mean you want like it's a complete difference to what jack ross would have done yeah you know what i mean like um jack ross definitely would not have done that he yeah. wouldn't have been in the bar would he no, <laughs> you know I mean? but, no and obviously you, you don't you don't want a manager who's just like you know like down the colliery tavern every five seconds it's not really quite the not quite the, the, the ethos you want to promote as your club but you, you do want a manager with just a bit more character and obviously that Having character does having character doesn't equate necessarily to just like neck and shots or whatever, mm. but like obviously it is just good to see the manager get himself out there when it's a good time to get himself out there. And I don't think Ross would ever have done that, you know. No. I mean, obviously I don't I don't know him personally, but I just don't think he would have ever done that. Anyway, it's enough back to Kayla. On to you, Sam. So uh, who would you have to replace Ross? Similar to what Ant said, really, I've been every time I go on Twitter and read up about one of the managers, I change my mind. I think if I was living in Dreamland, it would be Roy Keane. It just, I'd love someone that, even before a ball's kicked, just gets everyone excited. I know we'll probably need to be more realistic and look at people who've succeeded in this division, like your Stendhal's, Ainsworth's. I mean, Parkinson, I was looking his, his odds on now, looking and I can understand why. I mean, he's got three promotions from the EFL on his CV, which mm-hmm. if you're Stuart Donald and you think, I need to get out this division now, he's, he's probably... He's probably going to be his first choice, isn't he? But I don't know. I'd love, I'd love someone exciting, and I know people probably disagree, and I totally understand why. But I'd be so excited with Kevin Phillips, and I know it's a big risk, and I'm not being naive, but he would just, he would get everyone excited before, even before balls kicked, and then a few wins could just kick you on. But we do just need to get out this division ultimately, and I think that's going to be why who was appointed is appointed. Purely, if they can get us out of this division, like your Parkinson's. So, yeah. I don't. I understand why Ainsworth's in the picture. I just, I don't. He wouldn't be up there for me. It would either be Stendhal. Probably, I think Stendhal would be my number one. But I could see why we went with Parkinson. If that's what's going to happen, I could understand that appointment totally. Mm-hmm. My only gripe with Parkinson, though, is the same reason why I now have gripes with Coleman when I think about Coleman as our manager. Is that while obviously he's someone who's appeared before the cameras before and spoke about his position as the tragic hero. And that's not to patronise what he did at Bolton, but obviously he spent a lot of time, you know, making it very apparent that he was sort of put, he, he was he was fighting sort of against the current for the sake of fighting against it. And the Bolton fans had a lot of admiration for him for that. Similar to how we did with Coleman, but what I want from a manager is someone with recent success. Sadly, the issue with Parkinson is, is that he is most recently known as being the the, 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 the tragic hero, the, the gallant loser of Bolton, who, you know, were in a were, were in a massive situation and similar to Coleman, he was having a hard time getting out of it. But ultimately he was just part of a losing team for a long time. And I just think that that, that is the you know the opposite of momentum. We want someone like Stendhal, someone who has recently fired a team out of League One in emphatic style. What we don't want is someone, in my opinion, regardless of credentials, who has just had to just sit with, you know, the collapse of a football club and just experience loss after loss. It's just not the kind of person we want to bring to establish, to establish a culture and ethos around. You know, a manager is the centerpiece of your bridge when you're building a club's identity and style and culture. If if you bring in someone who's, you know, who's used to, you know, like excessive, degrading and humiliating losses, it's just. It doesn't sit well. It doesn't sit right with me. Not after Coleman. I think I just think we should learn that lesson. Yeah. No. I, I know what you mean, and I think we're obviously going to get behind whatever manager comes in on because it would be pointless not to. But I think it would be best to get someone in that is going to get people pumped straight away rather than our oh, given time. See what he does because that's all we've had with Ross in for a year. People saying given time. This isn't his team. I just don't want to fall down the same trap of seeing or oh, if he wins right happy and then one defeat and everyone's in meltdown again mm-hmm. do you know what I mean so that's why I think I think Pearson with Kevin Phillips as his number two would be would be great because people would see a manager like Pearson or, who I do think is a bit strange but he gets results and then you'd see Kevin Phillips and it would bring the nostalgia back and it would stop people just mm-hmm. jumping down the throat to a 1-1 one, one draw ultimately yeah I think my only issue with Pearson is just because I don't like him. No, I don't like him yeah. as a person. Like, but, I'm not a fan of him. Like, no, what? no. But the thing is, if, if he, the, if the issue, thing is right, though, we we'll see. We can see it all we want now. How we don't like him. But if he mm. comes in and he starts winning games, oh, I'd love. I him, think yeah. I think we're suddenly going to start liking him, aren't we? Yeah. You know, if, if suddenly, if suddenly we're in the automatics come December, then I think we are very much going to like Nigel Pearson. 
irrespective of you know the fact that he's calling journalists ost- ostriches and pinning down players by the neck if, he, if they're injured when, when they're injured on the floor. I mean, you know, he's, he's, he's been very out of order. Like, there's certainly no doubt about that. But you know, ultimately, w- within reason, a man within reason, a manager can justify a checkered past by winning games. You know, ag- again, within reason. But anyhow, on to you, Neil, for the last one. So we've had as the front runner, you would say Pearson, and with Phillips as number two was your your main one, Sam. Yeah, I and, and, and you're currently you're currently sat on Stendhal. Today I'm Stendhal, but this is going out tomorrow, isn't it? So tomorrow I'll be somebody else. Right, so don't so, quote yeah. us on that. <laughs> at, 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 the, at the time of recording this, and is Stendhal, but tomorrow you can be very well assured there's going to be yeah. Steve McLaren. So anyway, It'll be someone from Calexico in California or something like that. You know uh, what I mean? It why, will change. Why not? You, you know, got, got to be someone. Yeah. Anyway, Neil. Yeah, um, this might be a bit controversial, but um, I've got another point where I don't really care who's next. I, I, I think if you look at the if you look at the candidates that have been mentioned, the front runners, if you like, and Stendhal's and Ainsworths and so on, I think we're at the point as a football club with relatively kind of tight financial controls, it seems still, and for for the foreseeable future, I think there's only a certain caliber of manager that we can attract so whether it's Cook, whether it's Ainsworth whether it's Parkinson they've all got the pros and cons and whether it's someone more nostalgic such as Keane or Phillips again they've all got the pros and cons and I think I think whoever comes in we just need to get on with it and kind of yes they'll have good things about them yes they'll have bad things about them uh, whether it's their win-loss ratio or whatever but I just think we kind of we need to choose one as quickly as possible. I, I think the one kind of key criteria that I would look for is kind of their contacts, i.e., their ability to kind of attract new players. Because mm-hmm. um, when it, if we were to go up, this side isn't it's struggling in League One to get out of League One. So that that shift between League One and Championship is going to be huge. So, and I think we saw that on deadline day. We tried to f- sign six, seven left backs towards deadline day, and ended up with. Um, with the one that we did, uh, Le Boc. and Le I think if Keane had been here, he would have rang someone and we would have had a kind of decent left-back there knocking on the door. And I think that's an important point because of where we are geographically, because we can't chuck money at players anymore. It, it needs someone with, with either the character or the kind of conviction to say, right, when we do come to sign players, I can get the, the players to, to that will better us. And I think, again... We'll not talk too much about Ross, but I think that's maybe where he struggled. He's come down from Scotland. He hasn't got the network down here. He's got the recruitment team, inverted commas, in place. And I don't, again, I don't think I, th- I think that needs to be looked at from a kind of football operations point of view. Yeah. If I was to choose someone, my kind of heart would say Keane because he'd do exactly that. He'd get the players in that we need, and he'd kind of improve the players that we've got. But obviously, his temperament's kind of up for question, and kind of his longer term future. Um. I would go with Stendhal if if not, but I don't think it's mm-hmm. going to be likely again because he's got that kind of character. He, he he's kind of secret of success at Barnsley initially was to kind of pick players out of kind of leagues the same way that kind of uh, Norwich did it. Um, they picked three or four signings out of the kind of not even the Bundesliga. It was kind of the equivalent of the Championship in, it was in the, Germany. The Bundesliga's um, Vi. Yeah. Um, so I think we need, and I think Stendhal kind of brings, perhaps brings that. There's talk of kind of increasing the European scouting network and so on. But I think if you've got the manager who's got that network, then you don't really have to scout. You know, they pick the right person with the contacts and the knowledge, and and that looks after itself. But um, I've got a feeling it might be Paul Kuko. Yeah. I think his time up is is kind of times up as at Wigan reading between the lines. So I don't think they'll stand in the way, and I think it'll something you would relish as well. Yeah, I mean, I think there's probably a lot of good reasons. Well, what I said is a lot of good reasons. I think there's one really good reason where we could assume that Paul Cook would be a good choice of manager. You could get Will Grigg firing, maybe. Yeah. I think that's the number one um, that should be on the on the cards for whoever mm-hmm. comes in yeah. is get the best out of Will Grigg. What, 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 whatever it is. What was the crack there though with with when Grigg left Wigan? He was on the bench for the last 10, 15 games, wasn't mm-hmm. he? When Cook was in charge, and I, I don't know if it was just kind of the, the, to push up the. The asking fee, but Grig wasn't playing, and Cook was it was kidology, I think. So it'd be interesting if uh, if he was to come in. But yeah, any anyone who does come in needs to get our strikers scoring goals, whether yeah. that's through our pattern of play, mm-hmm. um, approach to the game, whatever. Yeah. I'm going to go briefly back to what you just said there, Neil, about scouting, like about scouting networks, because it's quite an interesting topic actually. What what the what we essentially have, I think. Well, I think that's what I mind you. What what we essentially need from manager, as far as scouting networks go, is either a manager whose sort of prestige in the game allows him 
to have quite a well connected network with a good reputation you know much like Roy Keane being the the absolute prime example of that or yeah you, you have someone like say like Stendhal who can who can tap into the German market and perhaps find you some some players there like many other very successful championship managers have done you know if you look at look at Wagner or or you know managers of the like who've gone into say the Bundesliga as via and they've, you know, they've pulled out some really good players who've played in the championship as if it was a lower standard that they can compete in better. I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that you could do the same for League One with perhaps some of the players who, you know, aren't maybe at, at quite the standard of those pushing for the Premier League. But equally, did we not think that that was possibly a thing that Ross had going for him as well? I mean, he got us McLaughlin, McGeoch and Ozturk from that division. Mm. And it wasn't particularly terrible business by any stretch of the thing if you look at those three players, but... Uh, n- none of them have made the difference to get us out of League One, have they? They haven't. Um, they certainly, I mean, McGeoch looks a very good player in a, in a certain style of football. Um, I think the problem with him is that, is that he's 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 played too deep and he can do that job, but he can also kind of his forward uh, his range of forward passing is good as well. I think I think with the, I think what coming in if I was the new manager, obviously I'm not going to be ever. But what I would like to see is kind of a director of football in place to kind of so as manager you go to your director of football and say these these are my needs go go and find and make sure the player fits within the culture of the football club and you and the recruitment team go and find those I don't I don't really care who it is the manager may give them a list of players but essentially and then the football the director of football works with the recruitment team and and brings that kind of player in and. We talk about kind of philosophies and cultures and how we want this identities and so on. And that's how Norwich have created their team and their identity now. They've got a really good director of football in place, um, experience at what he does. And with Farker and the recruitment team, they've brought kind of players in from all over the world. They've got lucky to, to an aspect with kind of with Pukki hitting form in the, in the similar kind of way Phillips did for us. Um, but I think that kind of is to take the pressure off the manager, to take the kind of, so the manager can focus on hit, on the players that we've got and improve them, get the director of football and the recruitment team to focus on on kind of going out and wherever that is, whether it's Scotland, Germany, wherever, to, to kind of find that, that those kind of players that we need that kind of fit into the culture of the club, mm-hmm. as opposed to your Didier and Dongs and Dillabodgies who... Who couldn't have been any further away from the culture of the club. Yeah, um, who were extremely randomly shoehorned in by Moyes, of course. But, yeah, yeah. You know, thankfully that is a lifetime ago, so we, we yeah. don't have to sort of we, we, for everyone's uh, sanity, we don't have to go into that. Mm. We, we can see around that, and we'll all be okay. You know, we're going to talk about current events, which are thankfully a bit more peachy than that was. But do you think we've been limited, Neil, um, sort of so far by our perhaps limited scouting, our, our, our limited sort of like scout roster? Do you think that's been a, quite a profound issue with recruitment. I think so. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's the, the the culture isn't one of go out and find players that we can nurture and and make better and make the team better in the meantime. And then perhaps I don't care if we became a selling club if as long as we are a better club and we are a better team. Um, if that's the way we need to do it, that's the way we need to do it. And that's the vast majority of football clubs these days. They kind of realise that either academies or or kind of going and finding the right players and selling them on at a great profit. I don't care if that's the way we are, but it's better than having no identity at all in terms of what we're trying to do now. Um, if we did have that identity, then Maggio would have stayed regardless of... We would have kind of made an example of that and given kind of within means the necessary um, wages that he, that he wanted at the time. Um, but yeah, I, I, th- I think maybe we hamstrung by the position off the field, the kind of lack of kind of dominant finances, if you like. But having said that, I think Norwich... Uh, spent about seven hundred and fifty mm. grand in the mm. summer to, to go from Championship to Premier League, and for all the puppies go down, they kind of they they are they, not kind of also runs at this moment in time. So, yeah, yeah, I think uh, as far as like off the field issues go, I think hamstrung is definitely one word. You know that there have obviously, I mean, there are always going to be limitations. I don't like using the the phrase "yeah, but we're a League One club" to justify a lack of success because. Our objective is to not be a League One club, so to say that is is sort of counterproductive in every sense of the word at its most fundamental level. But uh, yeah, you know, the, 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 obviously off the field, there have been limitations that I think of have led to us not doing what we want to do. And things like the director of football model, for example, or just perhaps someone with a more just like innately superior network themselves as a manager could just could just see us make the mm. difference that we need. But I think that's probably a good time to segue into the next section, and obviously. As far as um, uh, off the field scenarios go, as, long as as far as the the higher staff, the the backroom staff, the 
the people behind the scenes go. It has been quite a, quite a controversial uh, few few days moments for for the Sunderland fans as of recent on social media etc. But we'll try and steer clear of that for the time being. Take over rumours. What do we feel about that at the moment? How how do we just feel in general, Sam? It's it's the unknown, isn't it? It's that's what uh, that's what I think's getting everyone, so to speak. It, it the lack of communication. I, I don't know how far the communication could go. You don't. I mean, you don't want people to come out and get in bother for what they say. But it's it's the fact that we thought we were so close, and I think we probably were so close, and then suddenly weeks go by and you know further on and then word and gets changed to investment and then sort of strange announcement um that there's going to be an announcement so the announcement was slightly pointless but it was more about we can't really invest there's there's no point investing now because we can't spend anything in league one sort of is what i saw but i think it's more the unknown and the fact that everyone thought it was done really didn't they? and then we're we're no further on and probably further back weeks and months later, really. I think that's what's getting on everyone's nerves, really. Mm-hmm. And? Yeah, it, for me, it kind of <clears throat> it kind of thinks, because sometimes Donald's coming out and saying, right, he's, he's been on this podcast before and said, right, we have got a, a budget brilliant for League One. We don't need to spend any money to get out of League One. And then he's he seems to be spending every day looking for investment. So it come out with a clear point. Either we need investment in, or we can cope this season. It's it, it's it's obvious that we can't cope this season. We haven't signed anyone for any money bar George Dobson. And you look at the the signings that we have made, they're not as good as the lads who left. So we're not better off on the pitch. So if I just wish he'd be a bit more clear with what he says on, on Twitter and stuff like that. I mean, he's, he's come off Twitter today, hasn't he? Because apparently he's, we're abusing him again. Um, which, whoever it is, is, it's out of order. But maybe put a statement out and instead of us not knowing because like we're 11 games into the football season now mm-hmm. and it's all been surrounded by take over this take over that now surely that's going to affect performances on the pitch it must have affected Jack Ross's performance thinking I might be out of a job tomorrow if the Americans come in you know what I mean and it's just like it, it's just like really like un, the unclear thing about it and we just really want a bit of clarity on it and I just wish they'd just come out with just ear statements whether it's on whether it's off there we go mm-hmm. and then we can move on yeah. instead of not knowing all the time do you think the ambiguity of the situation is a big cause for let's say people getting annoyed on social media do you think people's people sort of like outbursts are popping up because they just want some answers yeah I do and into it I mean the you know, personal abuse is wrong. You know, like oh, you know, course. given the like, given like, like, you know, saying he's got to have like bodyguard and stuff. Given the personal abuse is wrong, but I think as a fan base, we do have a kind of right to want to be better than where we are. Um, I, I think um, we're what ninth now as of as of today. I know we've got a couple of games in hand, but. I'm not saying we should be 20 points clear at this time, but I expect us to be in the top two. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got a team on paper that is capable of being in the top two. Last season, we had probably the best team in League One and came fifth, was it, in in total. So, yeah, we're not, like, kind of... So I think we have got a bit of right to feel aggrieved of the club underperforming. I don't know. I, I, I totally was done where you're coming from, and I think the issue that we've had in recent times, this season more so than any other, because I think the sort of the the the, the general sort of tirade on social media, and I, and I don't really like dedicating any large parts of a podcast to talking about Twitter or Facebook, mm. because I want to talk about football. In the, the yeah. day, I don't want to talk about social media and people having arguments on the internet, because I just think it's a bit sad. Yeah. But regardless, I think what you tend to have is is that people are having let's say tirades on on social media on the internet because what we have had for the largest well, for the duration of the season, is a team that is, uh, I would say, I would say not considerably, but noticeably and slightly underperformed and underachieved. Yeah. I think that was the case last season. We had a team last season that had the, the capability, I think, on paper to finish in the top two. I think that as a bare minimum, could be finishing third and winning the playoffs, and we finished fifth. Yeah. So to that, to that end, we've underachieved. Now, a, a dramatic underachievement would be, say, finishing outside the playoffs and not even being in the running for promotion. That would have been a horrendous failure. Ultimately, it's a failure. But 
Yeah, it, failure's a failure, doesn't matter. Yeah, a, you know a, a failure is a failure, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And I think while Ross then had a second swing of the bat with, with you know, the next season coming along, the fans initially expected uh, an improvement on slightly disappointing as a bare minimum. They wanted a team that was at least satisfactory by this, the standards of the team. And we didn't really have that. We, you know, we had a team that was drawing 1-1 one, one and winning 2-1. We wanted a little bit more. And I think I was, I mean, I myself, I was kind of waiting for it to improve. But then once it became apparent that it wasn't going to improve, that was the point yeah. where we were all, I think, like, yeah, he's kind of got to go. He's not going to do it. But it's... Um, yeah, but can you remember at the start of the season and, um, you know, the fans got a little bit of... Um, a- well, a little bit of criticism of this off of uh, Jim Hunter was on here last week that we've got over, like, ambitions that are over our um, mm-hmm. right. Who pointed out at the just after playoffs that we are going to have a team that's going to get 100 points this season? Was that the fans? No, that was Stuart Donald. Mm-hmm. Right. So how come now it's the fan we've got? We have got expectations of what getting out of League One. Now I'm sorry, like, but I'm a Sunderland supporter. I've, you know, we've seen great times all together, and we've seen some absolutely horrendous times. But surely our kind of stature as a football club is better at being also runs at League One. You know, I think we've almost we've, we've seen two separate sides here because we hear some people saying, "Yeah, but you're a League One club." You shouldn't expect to be pushing to get out of League One, which is a completely kind of productive statement. But on the flip side, we've obviously had comments such as, you know, this is a hundred point season, and if 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 the if the the, the tagline is that it's a hundred point season, then you expect absolute dominance from day one. So if that's what the fans have been told is their expectation, that's what they've been given as the ambition, then obviously a one-one draw on day one to Oxford doesn't yeah. meet that. Yeah, we've yeah. got every right to be a lot disappointed yeah. with being. Ninth in League One at the mm-hmm. minute. We yeah. have got every right, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I mean, to be honest, I thought the hundred points was unrealistic, and I still do. Yeah, you should have said it then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's it. You know, like I think, I think for... you knew it was a mistake when he yeah. said it. Really. Well, it, it, it kind of has to be because you can't set that as a baseline requirement. It's far too unrealistic, even for the be- even for like the best teams that have been in fo- in the football league in their respective divisions. A hundred points is a massively yeah. tall order. If the if the expectation was to finish at least second, I would be happy with that because that's automatic. I don't want to be anywhere near yeah. Wembley again in my life. No. I want to be second or first. And I think that speak for all Sunderland fans when I say that's probably what we're all thinking. Now let's say day one, I remember thinking, okay, one one against Oxford, right, not the best result, but I, I wasn't on his back from the get go. I wasn't you know, I wasn't immediately sort of like sort of like leading the chorus of booze at half time yeah. if you want to do that you're more than entitled to you pay money for your season ticket go ahead and do it but I think you deserved a bit more time but then obviously as it gets on and then you do just realise hang on you know the naysayers from, from the start of the season you know in hindsight they were correct because they said he, they called him out that he couldn't improve and they were right so I think it's sort of just here we are really but obviously it's the issue is that it's been a very venomous time this season as far as sort of dialogue between fans and owners being concerned. Yeah, I think that's with, with football in general. I think this season it's it's got to an extent where it's a little bit too much. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, you know, like we'll, we'll go about on like last week when Tom Fannigan was out signing autographs and there's a fan, well, I'll, yeah. I'll see a fan in the lowest point of form giving mm-hmm. him abuse. That, that lad hasn't played football mm-hmm. on, in that game. So why is he getting abused? But it's... It's as much where it's a fine line between criticism and abuse, isn't it? So mm-hmm. it's like we have to just kind of tread a bit carefully with it. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, we have criticism. We are sort of saying in a in a quite a quite a respectful sense of the word that what you did was a mistake, and mm-hmm. we don't agree with it. And then, as you say, there's calling Tom Flanagan and every name under the sun when mm-hmm. one he's not played, and two, you know, he's he's there signing autographs. You know, I mean, if nothing else, all right, he's not been the best footballer for us, but he's taken time out of his day to to see to the fans. Mm-hmm. You have to respect that. If nothing else, there's nothing to disrespect about Tom Flanagan on on the, on the face of it. Certainly not. But it's just, I mean, uh, like I, like I say, I think if we just took social media out of it completely, we wouldn't have any of these issues because there just wouldn't be that 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 platform for comments like that to be made. And there's no other way of really saying that. Anyway, we've got some questions from the listeners, but before we do, on a more positive note, we did have a competition that we have uh, that we participated in and I can now happily announce the winner so earlier this week we announced another Roker Report competition teaming up with our friends at Homeless Ghost Prince to give away another one of their SCFC legend prints and we're happy to announce that the winner goes by the Twitter handle of JackChristopher018 well actually that's from Instagram that's Instagram handle ignore me well it's from Instagram regardless so Instagram handle is JackChristopher018 so congratulations Jack Uh, please DM the Roker Report podcast with your contact details and you will get your print so 
Congratulations. Anyway, on to the listeners' questions. Let's start with one from Grant McHugh, which says, if this season's remit is promotion, do you think if the new, if the new manager fails to get us promoted at the first attempt that he will get sacked, starting the managerial merry-go-round again? If so, would we be offering someone a short-term contract with a view to extension only if we get promoted? Let's start with you, Neil. What do you make of that? Yeah, it's an interesting comment, to be honest. It, it, I think rolling contracts are more more um, um, the the more common these days. The kind of three four year contracts don't really exist at this certainly at this level anymore. Um, I think if you're looking for one of them kind of up and coming managers such as Ainsworth and Stendhal, Ainsworth's not going to walk away from from Wickham on a kind of end of season till the end of season contract or uh, a rolling contract, if you like. Um, it's a good point to make. I, I, I think what we've talked about, Ross, is is results, i.e. end results, but also performances and identity and culture as well. And if heaven, heaven forbids we, we, we don't go up this season, but we've got a better identity and we've got a better kind of formula for the future, then I don't necessarily see why you would have to sack another manager at that point. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a fine line. It's a really good question, actually, in terms of, of kind of the, how long this next manager gets and and kind of what is deemed a success. Mm-hmm. And I think I think the key thing is not to quantify what success is in terms of. Um, I remember nineteen ninety eight. That maybe too young for some, some of the listeners, but Niall Quinn came out um, straight after and said, "Right, we'll get promoted next season." He didn't say we'll get hundred points or hundred and five points as we ended up getting. He said we'll get promoted, and I, th- I, th- I think what's happened um, with that hundred point prediction is that kind of Jack Ross has always had that kind of um, that kind of sign on his on his head, basically the target on his head that if if we kind of dip below that expectation, then he was always going to be in trouble. So, so yeah, I, th- I think. Whoever the new manager is, he'll probably get a two-year contract, I would have thought, similar to kind of what Ross got. Um, but I don't necessarily think we'd need to sack that manager um, if we were kind of to, were to fail to, to go up. But it, it depends on kind of what else mm-hmm. is going on, really. Is the risk now, though, Neil, of fan restlessness, similar to the one that we saw at the start of this season when obviously we were expecting to see improvement on last season but didn't immediately, hence why we had Bowes on 45 minutes, if, for example, the new manager comes in and he doesn't get off to a good start, is he in bother from day one? Um, possibly. Again, I think it depends on kind of how who that manager is and how he's kind of how he goes about his job in the first four weeks. I, I, I think he needs some time. So if if there's kind of a if there's a few one one draws or the, a defeat in or two in the first four or five games, I think we need to accept that um, and kind of. Try and buy into the overall philosophy of who, whoever that person is. Um, the bigger the character, the easier it would be, I would suggest, because the character kind of shines through the kind of the, the, the issues, uh, the, the bad, the worse at times, if you like. So, the likes of Phillips is going to get a lot longer than the likes of Phil pa- Parkinson. Parkinson, for instance, as Twitter polls suggest. And I'm not seeing Twitter polls as kind of gospel, but. Yeah, if, if Phillips lost his first three or four games, we'd still think he's a bit of a legend. And whereas if Parkinson comes in, he'll, he'll be he'll be needing bodyguards himself, I would suggest. And never mind Stuart Donald. So, so yeah, really good question. But um, yeah, let's we'll see how it goes. Mm-hmm. I think with someone like Phillips or Kane, someone who's already endeared themselves to the fans, I think maybe out of if nothing else, if out of fear of them not sort of um, validating the legacy we would want to rally around them and because we'd just want them to succeed. You know, I mean, it, it's it's the same kind of blind faith that the Mags attributed to Rafa. I mean, hopefully, I'd like us to see maybe a bit more a bit more of the, 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 the bigger picture than them, which isn't really saying much, of course, because, you know, we, we all know what the Mags are like. But, you know, if we if we had a manager who we would want to rally around because something about them just made them sort of like a necessary sort of figure as a Sunderland icon like Phillips or Kane, then we would want to get around them. And I think then that would do something to quell the restlessness that's going to be there. I mean, speaking of that, you know, like obviously it's it's been an issue, but I'll, I'll go to you here, Sam. This is quite, this is a, just something that I've just been on my mind now. Um, we've had obviously fan restlessness, understandably, because we still haven't improved. And that couldn't continue if we didn't improve under a new manager that perhaps isn't as a prominent a figure as others. Now, we had that, or we would have had that probably if we'd lost to Charlton the first day of last season. We had that in the Championship because we were losing in the Premier League, and we had that in the Premier League because it was, we were finding ourselves in another relegation battle. There is a consistent level of disappointment that we are used to as Sunderland fans. Because of that, 
is there a consistent level of restlessness that is always going to be there no matter what we are currently doing? Yeah, you've got a point, really. I think whoever takes the job, I think they'll be advised. They need to have thick skin. I mean, unless it's the two, like you say, Kane or Phillips, because mm-hmm. uh, people will... Well, we want every manager to do well, but you sort of feel like you know them. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You, you're rooting for them almost. But no, I, I know what you're saying. And whoever comes in should be aware that if they come in and don't win for the first five games or something, it's going to it's gonna be like they've been here five years and they haven't done anything. Because that's mm-hmm. under Ross, you always felt like, even when we won five games in a row and we beat the likes of Burnley, you felt like he was one, one, one draw away from getting the sack or mm-hmm. being put under pressure so because he was torn the line of just like slightly dis- being slightly yeah. disappointing and it only took one extra loss to make him a disappointment and yeah. get the sack you, you felt like it was coming with Ross really because it was always looming around him like that but I think as fans I don't like people saying oh um, like people have said in the past we, we're, we're arrogant and we think we have a god given right to be out of league one but at the end of the day, what what's wrong with thinking we shouldn't be in League One? Because mm-hmm. realistically, we should not be in League One, and we've fallen very quickly from the Premier League, which is where we should be, to this division. So, and we've got the. It's not like we haven't got the financial button. It's not like we're in the same boat as Bolton. We shouldn't be in this league. So, as fans, although sometimes I do think we expect too much. We should. We're never. We're not going to batter every team, every game. Do you know what I mean? But. I just that's why I feel the next manager or even like I said about Pearson if you have Phillips as his number two it should I'd like it to hit home with the fans and feel like right this is someone we can get behind mm-hmm. for the next five years do you know what I mean and yeah, not just right see how he's doing after a month because I feel like that's all we've had for as long as I remember really I mean go, un, unless you go about the likes of O'Neill and even then you just never feel like we have a stability and I think that's what we need and I think that's what Stuart will be looking for really stability and some of the fans can really get behind. Yeah, I think that the, while um, Grant, with, with the initial question, raised an interesting point that you know it, it could be an idea to offer someone a short-term contract with a view to extending it if they get promoted. I think you, what you're running a risk there is of continuing just the sheer lack of identity yeah. because you know like nothing screams, you know, uh, like not, nothing screams like club identity crisis like a short-term contract with a manager. <laughs> so what what you're essentially saying there is okay, this is going to roll on if you do well. But already, are we skeptical that you're not going to do well? At least offering a two-year contract, you're saying that look, okay, well, we've got you tied down to something here. Yeah. Like, well, rather, you're tying yourself down to something here. You know, you you've strapped yourself on the Sunderland Zeppelin. It's up to you to steer it. You know, if you, if you don't give manager that much of a of an of an incentive to join the club in the first place, then I think I think what you're saying from the get-go is that you know this is going to be hard. The fans are going to be on your back if it doesn't go well. And initially, the contract implies that we don't trust you enough. It'd be far better off just putting a caretaker in if they're going to do that till the end of the season. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, th- I think that's where the, we mentioned the role of uh, director of football before. I, th- I think if you are going to have this churn of managers, then that's where that role becomes really important because it's almost his responsibility, his or her responsibility to um, to kind of set that culture. So if a manager does leave, the manager coming in understands what the culture is and therefore runs with that culture. If they don't, they don't get the job. So. So I think in a in a time where football contracts in general uh, are shorter, I think the importance of that role going forwards, and I think it's like 17 out of 20 Premier League clubs now have that director of football role in place or football operations or whatever it is. So um, disclaimer from that role, I don't think Roberto Di Fanti was a f- director of football. I think he was an agent who kind of talked himself into a a kind of way of earning money into a football club. So so if any listeners are out there thinking we don't want that kind of model again, I'm not talking about a defending, I'm talking about a, a properly qualified director of football to come in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we'll go on to another question now from L Watson73, which is considering how bad this week has been, do you now think the decision to postpone the Fleetwood game was the correct decision? Also, what are your thoughts on Joey Barton's comments? Now, I've not heard those comments, so I can't, I can't say for myself. Like, I, I don't, I, I rather than sort of like being moth to a flame with whenever Barton pipes up, I just kind of leave him because <laughs> yeah. I just, yeah. I, I dislike him that much that I don't even care what he has to say about us. But I mean, I don't know. I suppose we'll get at that if you guys have heard that. I mean, I haven't. Yeah. But uh, we'll, we'll start with the first, the first part of the two questions. So, do we think that was actually in that respect the right call? And I'm not sure he would have been sacked if it hadn't been the international. Great, mm. to be totally and honest with you. Did, I mean, well, we all said at the start that it was the right call to get him sacked. So do yeah. we think that we needed 
it, it was a necessary evil to have the international break and a postponement to get Ross sacked. I would have still rather have played, to be totally honest with you. Um, I, I kind of think that no matter what manager's in charge, no matter what 11 players you can put on the pitch, we would have still been relative. It would have been a good game against Fleetwood. And I, can, I can get from both points. I can get, from, I can get the point what the, the, um, the question is because it's kind of given us that little bit extra time to get somebody in. But we're kind of nowhere close to even a point. And had it been that got somebody in straight away once Ross had been sacked, we could have been ready for Fleetwood, which is a, which is also another side of that. But I'd have still rather played. I'd rather just have the points on the board than having to play catch up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? Uh, one of the biggest downfalls last season was the game in hand. The games in hand. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I. I pointed the table out with people and they said, oh no, we've got three games in hand as if it was nine points yeah. and it was like banging your head against the wall at the end and then would draw 1-1 one, one, and and then suddenly them games in hand became playoffs really. But mm-hmm. no, I, I didn't hear all of Barton's comments but I think the gist of it was that we called it off because we were scared of... Uh, you, <laughs> said, uh, you said something today as well saying that we're pining yeah. for him to be manager so, you know, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, with, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I actually just ignore everything he says. That's what else. he needs, just... Oh, yeah. I like know your little brother isn't he? Yeah. just ignore him I, I can't help but think because I think didn't Ross come out and he was fairly vocal in that he wanted to play the game um, I can't help but think this is a conspiracy theory that actually Donald knew this was going to happen over this so kind of maybe overruled that mm-hmm. decision um, having said that Ross did say that I think it was three out of his back five from the was it the Sheffield no the, 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 from one game I think the, the three out of the back five had played some kind of role um so if, if we were to lose that then that was maybe a little bit upheaval um but i, th- I think the, the main thing as football fans we just don't want any 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 uh match to be postponed or delayed or kind of because we kind of we look forward to it all week and right, tickets for the sports bar is absolutely devastated yeah <laughs> that, so, is, uh, that is an absolute wound that like yeah. cold it, tuesday night in november now as well so oh. look forward to that yeah, I think I think Barton. I mean, Barton came out today and said uh, that something along the lines of kind of Sunderland fans pined for his kind of they, they look forward to him coming and stuff, so we can give him grief and stuff. And I, th- I think with the likes of Barton, you've just got to kind of let that go over your head. And and I'd love for Sunderland fans not to even acknowledge Joey Barton come November. And and if we acknowledge him, boo him, then that's what he wants. He's the Pant Nine villain, really, isn't he? And, yeah. And, and he needs to remember that he's at Flatwood. <coughs> Um, I, I, I can put on record. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I can. I, I could put on record for the. Uh, you know, like I don't ever. I've, I've never in my life claimed to be the voice of the Sunderland fans, but I'm going to for the next ten seconds just to say that I don't think any Sunderland fan has ever pined for Joey Barton <laughs> no. in any sense of the word. <laughs> so I mean, obviously, well, everything Joey Barton says, and thanks for enlightening me on his comments. I'm glad I didn't read them directly. Thanks for taking that bullet for me, lads. <laughs> but ultimately, you know, Joey Barton is always and always will exist just to try and wind people up like he's never made in his life made like a a substantive comment that's had any sort of like deeper real truthful meaning to it you've only got to look as far back as let's say you know like the amount of like the amount of sort of like times he's run his mouth over the years you know either as a player or as a manager against Sunderland and still when I look at him I I don't I don't see like the the same sort of like wry smirk he gives in interviews I see the terrified man who was having the shadow of Dixon or two who stood over him in 2007, looking like he'd rather be anywhere else than on a football pitch. That's what I, when I think of Joy Barton, I think of the time he almost got shinned by a two who. I, I, th- I think Devil's Advocate, if I was a F- Fleetwood player and the, them initial kind of when he came out and said, Of course, they scared of us, that would make me feel pretty good. And if I was a Fleetwood supporter, that would mm-hmm. make me feel pretty proud of it. So I think I think he's come out, it's kidology at the end of the day. If, um, I, th- I think from kind of kind of motivating his players and his supporters and getting his club behind him, then that's something that again we're talking about Jack Ross again. Or I am, yeah. but um, that's something he didn't do. He didn't rally. There wasn't a war cry. Whereas Barton's obviously mm-hmm. using that tenacity and he's kind of um, well, slightly does. weird kind of um, kind of personality to mm-hmm. to kind of get people's back up. And yeah, yeah, the man's been uttering the same scouse war cry for the past ten years. You know, yeah. he's, he's. I mean, you know, to his credit, if nothing else, I'm sure he's very good at galvanising the fan base and the players. 
because he's a nasty, he's a he's got a very nasty attitude that boards very well at the standard of football. So yeah, to that, to that, league one, he? oh yeah, to that end, I'm sure he, he'll sit down at the ground. And the fact of the matter is that if he wasn't a Newcastle player, we'd think, oh, maybe we need that kind of character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He'd be my choice for manager on Tuesday, but there's a fair bit of honest with you. Could be, could be, irrespective <laughs> of of his of his mag background. But uh, anyway, let's move on from Joey Barton. <laughs> so we have one more question from Mac and Pyro, who says, "Will this uncertainty around the next appointment and the ongoing takeover slash invest?" lead to some of our squad looking for moves in January to a more stable club. McLaughlin still hasn't signed a deal and a number of players joined on a two-year deal. How much convincing will they need to sign an extension with the club? We'll go to you, Neil, for that one. Oh, Christ, I haven't, I haven't really looked that far ahead in terms of January transfer uh, deadline and so on. I haven't even thought about it. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think if, if if the cup run tells us anything, it tells us that the squad is fairly together and whether they would get together for Jack Ross, um, the professional, so I'd expect them to be de- together for anyone else who came in. Um, I think the vast majority, and I mean the vast majority, are kind of, not kind of, they should be kind of proud to be at a club this big, whether it's in League One, Championship or whatever, and they maybe need to look at the matches, the Zoros, um and, and kind of see what else is on offer if they were to leave. Um, McLaughlin, I could, from a geographical point of view, if you got a decent kind of move back to Scotland, then I, I could understand that. Um, but anyone else, if they don't want to play for this football club, then get yourself away, lads. That, that would that would be my philosophy, and, and there will be plenty, again, if we get the right manager, and there'll be plenty of lads who do want to play for the football club. So I don't think that... This is instability kind of, the, the manager will be fixed fairly quickly. The instability mm. off the field, I can see why that may kind of upset a few players. But if they don't want to be here, then then no. see you later. We're not in the Premier League here. We're not kind of challenging for anything. So if you don't want to play for this club in League One, then we certainly don't need that kind of player anyway. So. No, you, yeah. you you need nothing else but baseline loyalty in League One, don't you? You know, we'll 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 save the mercenary kind of persona of when we're back in the Premier League in the year 2050. But mm-hmm. until then, we'll just sort of you know I would would rather have some more maybe more genuine figures at the club. But you know, just saying what you're saying there, Neil, it's making me wonder. I mean, I don't think there are any players. You know, that if we, we were to say lose one player in January and I didn't know who it was going to be, I wouldn't be that concerned wondering who it's going to be. But if, if looking out on the pitch, I've did, did that look like a team that players want to leave? You know, you, you look at like Logo Nine who's running around, you know, mm-hmm. like like, and he's loving it here. You look at Jordan Willis who's turned down championship teams to come here. Mark McNaughty turned down a championship team to come here. They they all want to be here. Mm-hmm. So I, I have no worries at all for any of them wanting to leave. The McLaughlin thing, if he wants to go, you know, if, if that's affecting his performances, which it could be, if he wants to leave in January, jog on. You know, what I mean, we've mm-hmm. got a steady number two, Lee Burge, who really. Possibly will be playing against Wickham the way McLaughlin's been playing, um, and any of the any of the other ones, I, I'm, I'm with you. I probably wouldn't cry if, if any of them left. Really, no. I think I think Willis is probably the one player who I'd be upset mm. if he left. Obviously, yeah. given that he's just signed, he's not going to be leaving. Yeah, but the majority of them as well, where they're going to go, that there's no one really who's going to improve. Possibly all nine. Um, I was going to say all nine. Yeah, would go to a higher level. But everyone yeah. else, you're just going to go to the League One club, mm-hmm. and you know, uh, not to sound like a high mate, we're probably the biggest club in that division. Yeah, why would you go anywhere so else? So where are you going to go? No, if if League One's currently your level, then I mean, mm. I mean, I mean, let's be honest, right? Like the the lads we've got, the the, the canny lads, and they're not daft. You know they'll see. You know they, as as much as we can, they can see the potential at Sunderland. You know if you if you are part of a winning team, they 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 might be sat there thinking now wherever they are. Look, if, if the right gaffer comes in and he gets us playing in a system that is effective and works and gets the fans' bums off the seats, then suddenly we are looking next season at promotion. We're looking at what could well be a forty a forty thousand capacity, a forty thousand strong attendance if we're doing well in the championship you know it honestly like the, the potential would seem limitless to them that's not to belittle them but that's just to say that or oh, now was at Wickham before and you know yeah. Wickham's push for the championship might be the most success they see in the next 30 years okay and, and again that's going to sound like it's derogatory but that's just that's just generally how it goes for the size and stature of clubs yeah yeah it's just something in football club mm-hmm. at the end of the day yeah you know, it's, it's not Wickham it's not yeah, I think I think at that ending, I would like to see a new manager get a kind of a set eleven, maybe fourteen players that he mm-hmm. plays. You know, he, under Ross, we never knew who he's. He, he, he had that team, and then we went to Sheffield United. He made eight changes, supposed kind of fringe players, and then the next team uh, game, 
he made two changes back. So I don't think he ever knew what his first kind of eleven. So I think if anything, it will the squad will settle to say, right, this is my first eleven. These are my kind of regular substitutes. Anyone else, you're maybe not going to be in the match here squad. Maybe them lads will think, yeah, I need to look elsewhere. But if that's where them lads are, then then yeah, they'll they'll go elsewhere. But uh, yeah, so maybe we'll see a more settled squad. Hopefully, mm-hmm. um, just anyone who's not going to play with the squad like a Rubik's cube. You know, yeah, I'd rather once yeah. we've got something that's mm. set in place. Yeah, it's set in place, and obviously you are going to have injuries, and you may have to change things every now and then for certain teams. Yeah, given given contexts, but yeah. I mean, look, if I ask any of you lads now what was Ross's style of play in, in you know, the latter half of this season before he got before the latter part of his season before he got sacked, you know, I'll ask any of you now, give me an answer. Put it this way, I only want to see Joel Lynch up front if it's the FA Cup final <laughs> yeah. in the last minute and we won nil down. I don't want to ever see that again. No, <laughs> crikey. Uh, no, I won't be satisfied as a Sunderland fan until we get a, a recreation of Alan Mosterk's goal that he scored for Hearts. Uh, still <laughs> waiting know. for that, aren't we? Ah, uh, Edge of the seat yeah. stuff. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take us through. I'll take his is 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 every now and then his root warm balls like when it when he when he gets that right. But yeah, yeah I mean, I don't know. It's just yeah, we're, we're just. I, I just feel like we're we're crying out for just an identity, and that's not, that's not a groundbreaking point by any stretch of the imagination. We just need someone to come in who is just going to decide we're going to play this way, we're going to play like this, I'm going to play these lads, and that's what my favourite team is. Yeah. If we can just see that, and if we can work out ourselves what the manager's style of play is, then I think we'll be we'll be satisfied as long as we're winning. You know, yeah. what, what we don't want to see is, even if we are scraping wins and maybe we aren't doing terrible, if, if we're not going about fourth and fifth place, and we're looking at a team that you know one week is very different from last week, and suddenly all nine's playing in his seventh different position in, in, in six games. Then we're going to think, right? Well, what's the point here? You know, it's going to we're not going to feel convinced. That's one of the main things. I think I was in the pub before the Lincoln game with me mates, and you're waiting for two o'clock to get the team news. And I feel like every time I've got team news this season, even going back to the last, you're always a bit confused. Hmm. And at least two positions on the bench, and then. Sometimes you look at it and you think the bench is maybe better than the team. And mm-hmm. I can't remember the last time we had a set 11 where even if one person drops out, you're thinking, no, oh, that's not the usual 11. Yeah. We don't have one. We've got, a, I mean, it's good to have a good squad and that's what we've got, but you need dependency really. Mm-hmm. And other than McGeady, I don't see under Ross him having him, him dependent on a certain player. I mean, even the captaincy when I know Leppert is not going to play every game, but then McLaughlin's mm-hmm. captain, then McGeady. Then power now Willis and it was it's just it's all about identity like you said we need we need uh, stability at the club yeah. and we're crying out for it really mm-hmm. but that's it again and I think you know it, it's I, I don't want to keep throwing like really somber and like depressing <laughs> questions at, at, you, at you lads but you know uh, just, just as I say have we have you seen an identity under Ross to which you would say no you know this isn't a yes or no question but when was the last time you saw an identity. You can say no silence. If you want. Yeah. Silence. Um, you, you've got to, you've got to look at Allardyce, haven't you? You've, you've really yeah. got to look at Allardyce at the end at but, the end of the. But again, the Allardyce, the the the, the modern post Bolton Sam Allardyce has never been a long term plan man again. Though no. he's 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 the master of of stop gap motions yeah. to save clubs from relegation. I wouldn't even count Allardyce's team no. as, as that because. If, and you look as well, Allardyce's little sort of empire he built was founded on paper mache because as soon as he went, Kirchhoff was injured, Corny wanted away. Mm. You know, no one wanted to play anymore. Kabul up and left. I think we kind of were though, at the end of at the end of the Everton game when you know he's like, doing all this on the pitch. And I honestly thought that was I was like, we're going to be all right here. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then from from then on, there's been you know terrible managerial appointments after terrible managerial appointments. Um, you know, fair play to you know the. That lads who did come in to try Barmoy's, you know, Grayson uh, tried to give us an identity. Well, you don't need to say the lads that came in to try Barmoy's because saying the words come in to try did effectively Barmoy's. Yeah, 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 well, just Barmoy's altogether. Um, But like, I mean, Grayson came in and give it, give it his go, but he was out of his depth. Same with Coleman, you know, you know, said all the right Mm -hmm. things. You know, I mean, I loved Chris Coleman as, as a person. You know what I mean? But his managerial um, tactics weren't great. And then you look at Jack Ross, who kind of is very, very clever man. You know, you see, you see his tactics on the the BBC. He's got like a little article on there, and he's a very clever man. But he's just he's got no style. You know, his style was what was it? You know, mm-hmm. we're, we're sat here eighteen months into his tenure, haven't got a clue what to say about it. Mm-hmm. I th- 
Yeah, go on, Neil. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think in terms of culture identity, kind of that that takes time and it takes stability and most importantly, it takes resources as well. And I don't think it, it, the basket case that Sunderland has been for now on a dec decade now, it, all those things haven't been in place. Uh, the managers haven't been here long enough. As and says, Allardyce was the closest it got, but he was here for a number of months before he ran off for the England job. So, so I think I think if we are to get a culture and identity, then I think fans and and everyone inside outside the club need to need to remember that's going to take a long time to to kind of get that. That's not going to be an overnight thing. So even if the new manager comes in and does well, there's still lots of work to do and on on and on the pitch and off the pitch and in that respect. So yeah. Yeah, well, I think that's probably a good place to, to sort of steer towards the end of today's podcast. Hopefully in the future, there have been a miserable quite bunch of few recently, especially the ones that I've hosted. Um, I'm afraid I can't apologise because the, I haven't had enough to be positive about. But anyway, before we end off, we have two things that are more positive notes. Well, one that is a more positive note and a second that we're going to end on, which will hopefully be a more positive note. Can we give a quick shout out to the Sunderland ladies team who dispatched Barnsley 1-0, being the only Sunderland team in recent memory to keep a clean sheet. So well done, lasses. It's nice to have some good news to talk about. So thank you very much for that. So we'll have our predictions. We'll go around the table and get our predictions for the for the Wickham game coming up. So we'll start with you, Ant. What we do is with the predictions is just give me what you think will be a brief synopsis of the game and a full time score. Well, it's not going to be a classic. <laughs> I think, um, to be honest, I think whoever does come in this week, that is the worst possible game to yeah. be given. Wickham away. Um, I think we will... In typical Jack Ross form, draw one one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the, the spectre of Jack Ross oh, horrible the one one. Yeah, it's, it's such a difficult game, isn't it? We'll go up there yeah. unbeaten at home all season. Um, there's such a horrible, horrible side to watch. Mm -hmm. um, to be fair, played ends with that's that's his remit to do, and he does it brilliantly. And they are um, an absolute set of shit houses, to be honest, but. Yeah, I think it'll be 1-1. One, one. I'm going to go up for Maguire to score Weldy and I can Fenway to score in the last minute <laughs> and do his silly celebration. God, that's an yeah. awful... That's awful, isn't it? What an awful <laughs> prediction that is. You, you can leave now if you want. God, <laughs> that's horrendous. Yeah. Anyway, so much there's been a more positive note. Sam, you're up next. Currently trying to get that out of my head, but um, <laughs> I'm having flashbacks to last season and I, just, I don't even have any words to describe the game last season. It was... Mm -hmm. It's like something out of Green Street in the end, but is that Marcus Bean still playing for them? He should be in prison, probably. Can someone more time. please, please, please give him one? No, I take I, I don't like to see players get injured, but that was just such a disgusting tackle on what more. Can someone do yeah. that? Yeah, Max Howe, take the red card. We'll we'll probably get it rescinded anyway. So. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway. I don't know. It, it it I'm gonna have to see what comes off the top of my head because it could be literally anything. Because uh, obviously we don't know. I mean, we could have their manager by the time, but um, I don't want to say it, but I do think 1-1, one, one, which I think <laughs> would be a, a, a decent result, which is mm -hmm. a scary thing to say. But yeah, I think I think one's each and hopefully we equalise rather than your prediction. I, I said we'll I think we'll take the lead and then they'll score on the last minute. Yeah, which is So, so have we both got to leave now? <laughs> yeah. No, we'll I, be alone I, together. I, I hope we equalise in the last minute then, <laughs> so it feels like a win rather than one of the worst defeats ever. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, Neil, you're up. I'm going to end with some positivity here. Um, as the, it's a 72 minutes gone, and John McLaughlin's keeping a clean sheet. Um, oh. Scotland are winning 5 0. Uh, who are they playing? Oh, they're playing San Marino. San Marino. Oh, right. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to see it. Never mind, anyway. Yeah, hang, on, um, hang on, I'm going to stop you there, but is he keeping a clean sheet? He is, yeah, He's yeah. He's keeping a clean sheet. sheet. Yeah. I, don't yeah. care, I, I don't care if it's against San Marino, the, yeah, the man's keeping a clean sheet. Let's see if he's made any saves. Um, no. Let's have a look. <laughs> Um, they've had one shot on target, two shots on target, oh, San Marino. Well done, so it says more about Scotland than San Marino, I guess. But, uh, but that's two saves. That's two times the ball has rolled feebly into his arms from 30 yards out. Yeah, yeah. Well, he yeah. never threw it into his own head like he did last week. So it's, 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 you know, it's He's positive. He's moving forward, isn't he? It's positive. Yeah. Interesting <laughs> to see Lawrence Shankland scored as well. The, oh. the ones linked with Sun and Lawrence Shankland. Didn't he score like the first minute or something? Wasn't it like an immediate goal or something? Um, no, I think McGinn scored a hat trick to begin with, and then he scored in the oh, 65th. Gary's John McGinn. Uh, one, of, one of my mates yeah. absolutely loves John McGinn. 
Has oh, he played for? He plays for Aston Villa. 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 Scored oh, yeah. one of the best scores I've ever seen last season. Again, was that the Villa? Oh yeah. My, my, my hip supporting uh, friend, off point here, but my hip supporting friend said McGeoch was a better player than John McGinn. Um, mm. And the rest is history. Anyway, next week, my prediction: um, we're going to get a manager that at least thirty percent of the fan base is going to be happy with. That would be positive if you're looking at the Twitter polls, and we're going to win two 0 next week. I reckon. Who's going to score? Um, I'm going to go for Power and Will Grigg. That would be nice. That would be really, really nice. So you're predicting Steve Cook basically be the manager? <laughs> well, he might come off the, the, the he might come off the bench in the 93rd minute. And, Steve Cook? And, maybe, yeah. Just <laughs> yeah. for Bournemouth, don't he, Steve Cook? Paul, Paul Cook. Cook. Yeah. Paul Cook. Oh, yeah. nice. That, that's it. Um, no, the way I see it, we'll, we'll go ahead. Um, everyone will think we'll draw 1-1. Then Grig will come on to replace someone with, in the 90th minute and, and score, the, score, the, score the second. And mm-hmm. We'll all come home happy. Uh, well, I'm going to go for a more positive take as well. I think we'll, we'll divide the room up in the in the you're a misery if you sat across from me if you sat on my side you've got a bit more of a bit more of a lighter take on the on the events of a Sunderland fan but no because I like to remain obviously eternally optimistic as I always am I'm going to say we're going to win three one I think we are I think we're going to play them in what's going to be initially a very cagey affair I think I mean I don't know who the new manager is but whoever he is is going to take this game by the scruff of the neck he's going to see playing Gareth Ainsworth Wickham so I'm assuming it's not Gareth Ainsworth obviously. <laughs> So but whoever he is is going to take it by the scruff of the neck. And despite the fact we're playing a team that's been prized for its very sort of like anti-football, aggressive, like sort of like quite nasty style. In spite of that, we're going to get on all right. We're going to take the lead. I think they're going to equalise through some awful goal. It's going to be quite a scrappy game. Going to be players barking at each other throughout. But ultimately, I'm going to go for Maguire to score two. I'm going to go for Greg to score one. I'm going to go for Greg to score the last one. And it's going to be quite a nice goal, and it's going to get him off the mark for this season. Hopefully, hopefully for the foreseeable. I mean, I've said that quite a few times now, but this time it's actually going to happen. So you know, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much, lads, for coming today for Cheers. helping me to talk about talk about uh, my life as a Sunderland fan. It's always always good for these little group therapy sessions. You know, it's <laughs> well, it, nobody wants to be lonely. So well, no, that's you know, it. You we'll know, do it together. Well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, nice knowing we'll, there's others in the same boat. <laughs> We had it too good for too long, you know, when we were like winning games and all that. So, you know, yeah. it's it's nice to it's nice to be back to back to the glory days when I first joined and we had Coleman and we were losing all the time. It's, it's probably Rogue Report's fault that we're doing so badly. It seems to be our fault for everything else. <laughs> so. Well, you can you can read you can read my face and see all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully it's an audio based platform so nobody else can. Anyway, thank you very much and for coming in today. Cheers, thank you. Cheers. Hey, you're very welcome. And Sam, thank you very much as well. Pleasure, my brother. And Neil, thank you very, very much. Cheers, thank you very much. No worries, Okie Doke.